Jesus, Jesus. Uh oh. <laughs> Didn't sound like that while ago. What happened? You're going to be singing that in the shower. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Hey, we're going to your neighbor and say, neighbor, man, I'm glad you're here. Look at your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, I told you you wouldn't melt. <laughs> it's a good day, good day to worship the Lord, to give him thanks, to give, ask him for strength, to help us to get through the journey ahead. It's just a good day to be in the presence of the Lord. If you have your Bibles today, turn with me to Psalms chapter 46. I was only going to read a verse, but I think now we're going to, I'm going to read the whole thing. Psalms chapter 46, it's Family Sunday, so we're blessed to have the children in church with us, and I know that can be uh, difficult for parents sometimes when you have little ones. I understand that, but you know what? At the, the moment that you start getting distracted or your kids start pulling on you, you're like, man, I was just about to really feel the presence of the Lord. You know what we need to do? We need to thank God for kids. When you thank God for having a church where kids are, are able to come and be a part and worship, some of us didn't grow up or have that chance, and when you thank God that he's given us children to raise up, because this is the way the nation's going to be changed. It's going to be not when a bunch of old people get saved finally or whatever happens, but it's when we raise up a generation that learns early on that I am a child of God, and God has called me for a time such as this, and I'm going to live different and be different than what I've seen gone before me, and now... I'm starting to preach, but I just want to encourage you to, to thank God that we have a church where we have kids and to thank God for the people, for Krista and Makai and Brandy and all of their helpers that week after week after week, when you're sitting in here doing whatever you want to do, and they are sowing into your kids and loving on your kids. And so, anyway, Psalms chapter 46 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Through the earth, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The dwelling places of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Who has wrought desolations in the earth? He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns chariots with fire. Cease striving or be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you that no matter what comes at us, the world, the storms, all the stuff in life that can be so difficult. God, we thank you that you are our refuge and strength. And though the world changes and everything's different, God, you are always the same. And you are always going to protect us and provide us as we cling to you, as we hide in you. And so, Lord, I pray that in this moment today that we would settle our minds and we would be still and we would know today that you are God. Speak to your children this day. Have your way in this service. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. So there was this elderly woman, and she walked into the church. And this friendly usher greeted her at the door, and he helped her up the flight of steps. And he said, where would you like to sit, he asked politely. She said, the front row, please. He said, you don't really want to do that. This preacher is really boring, and he will see for sure if you fall asleep. She said, do you happen to know who I am? No, he said. He said, I'm the pastor's mother. The man said, do you know who I am? She said, no, I don't. He said, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we're talking about habits of happy people, and I know it's a little bit silly, or it seems like it to me, and I've been t reading a silly joke every week, but the reality is, I know it's true in my life, but it's good to smile, and it's good to laugh a little bit, because there's so much in this world that just S-U-X, you know what I mean? And I mean, we just get down and depressed, and it seems like we're never going to make it through this day and this situation. And uh, it's just good to laugh. It's good to smile. It's good to think on good things. You know, we know this. There's plenty of bad habits to deal with. There's plenty of things in life that we fall in and get into the rut of we're just going to do it this way and go through the motions. And, and we're really not trying to talk about too much of the bad habits through this, but just considering the fact about maybe there's habits that would improve our life, that might bring a little bit of joy. At the very least, they're going to strengthen us to, to get through some of the moments. I mean, there's plenty of tough stuff in the world, and we just need to understand that, that we live in this fallen world, and stuff happens, and storms come up, and things that I don't understand. It wasn't the way I planned it, and there's disappointments, and there's breakdowns, and there's droughts, and there's economy crashes, and things happen to me because other people did them to me, and other I'm affected by them, and I didn't know it, and I didn't have anything to do with it, but there's plenty of stuff that just gets us down and makes it very difficult, and it's just the fact that it's good to have some things. Things. It's good to have some habits that if we're proactive in doing these things and we're consistent in doing them, that they can help us to keep going and face the things that are ahead of us. And so we've been talking about some good habits. Habits, we call them habits of happy people. Doesn't mean that everything's going to make us happy, happy, whatever, but it's just talking about understanding habits that make me realize that I'm blessed of God and that the joy of the Lord is my strength and that I'm well able to do all the things that God has called me to do. And so just a recap of kind of where we've been through, we talked about focusing more on what we have than what we don't have. So many of us are focused so much on what we don't have and we get stuck in that. And it's just being aware that with God in the middle of it, what you have is enough. Amen. We talked about being generous. You know, we're all trying to keep our little, our little pile together and stay out of my patch and all this stuff. But the reality is if we want a full and blessed life, we're going to have to learn how to be givers. God is a giver. And the most blessed people that are happy and successful, they're people that give. I, we, I did a funeral yesterday in San Angelo, and that was the biggest trait of his life. Everybody knew him by the gifts that he gave. He gave gifts to kids. He served at the Texas Boys Ranch in San Angelo for 40 years. This man was a giver, and I'm just telling you that you and I have to make it a habit to be generous. Generous with our time, generous with our money, generous with our love, generous with our prayers. We have to be generous because if we don't make it a habit, we're not going to do it. We're going to be focused on gathering up my little chicken and my little pile and all that stuff. The last one we talked about last week, a couple, enjoying the journey. How many of you know sometimes it can feel like you're in a rut, amen? We all want to be on the mountaintop and we can get focused on this pit that we're in. But the reality is that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. His rod and His staff, they strengthen me. Let us enjoy the journey because God's going to connect the dots and cross the T's and dot the I's. And let me just enjoy the journey knowing that God's in control. And as I follow Him, nothing can touch me. I'm just going to walk in Him. And the last thing we talked about was, you know what? There's some things in your life you don't like. Change it. Quit complaining about it. Make a change. Michael Jackson said it. He said, hey, it starts with the man in the mirror. I'm not moonwalking today, although I've been challenged to do it. But I might just do it. You know, I can moonwalk. <laughs> Woo! So this is just kind of where we're at. Praise the Lord. That was for the kids. None of them saw it. They're all. So today we're going to talk about a couple that are important, that are challenging. I pray that you don't just hear these messages and forget them when you leave here. But these are designed to, to possibly be something, not all of them maybe, but maybe there's one of these that you say, you know what, I could benefit from that. Let me strategically try to make this a habit this week. We discussed early on it takes about three weeks to create a habit. And so let us commit to some of these things that speak to us. Write them down. Keep, you got notes. Keep this and try to implement them. The first one today is slow down. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're going too fast. We all need to learn to slow down. Psalms 46.10 that we read today, the Lord says this, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I'm the one that's going to be exalted. I'm the one that needs to be exalted in your life. And it just makes me think there's so many different analogies. But as I was preparing this week, 
God, I just think, have you ever been on the interstate with lots of traffic? I mean, right now, if you're going to go to Abilene and you get on the interstate out here, it's single lane and it's packed wall to wall. But have you ever been on the interstate where there's a lot of traffic? And most of them, half of them at least, are going way too fast. They're clipping your mirror off. They're cutting you off. They're waving at you with the single finger. They're doing all this stuff is going on. Some of you didn't get that. <laughs> They're going way too fast. And so what happens when you're the one and you got your kids in there and you're trying to do right and you got that 10 and 2 grip on, man, you're puckered up like that. You're like a dog passing a peach seed. You're getting nervous. You're watching everywhere. And when you finally get there, you're so full of anxiety and you give out and you're like, I am stressed to the max. It wears you down. Well, that's kind of funny, but that's what's happened to our world. The world that we live in. We're going so fast and it seems like there's we need to do and there's so much so little time to do it and we're going here and I'm going there and I'm trying to do this and I'm trying to get this done I'm picking the kids up I'm dropping them off taking him lunch I'm going shopping I got a Walmart I'm going all this stuff I got to go to work I'm doing all this we're going in 12 different directions and by the way that probably means you're one twelfth as effective in each one of those areas as you should be because sometimes we confuse doing more with 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 busyness and actually, we can be really busy and do less than we did when we were doing very little. And at the same time, we're doing all this stuff and going all these different directions. And at the end of the day, we're wondering what's wrong with us. We're sucked dry. We're out of gas. I have nothing to give to my friends, my family, my kids. I have nothing left. We're out of gas. And people say this, well, if I just had more time, if I just had a little more time, can I tell you that we all have the same amount of time? There's 60 seconds in a minute. There's 60 minutes in an hour. There's 24 hours in a day. There's 365 days in a year. There's 10 years in a decade. We all have the same amount of time. What we have to get better is this. We have to figure out how to manage our time better. We have to figure about not doing so many things and managing our time better and consider, consider, what is really important in my life? What must be done? What are the things that are going to lead me in the direction that God is calling me to go? As a parent, there's some things that I have to let go of, some habits, some, some old things that I like doing. I have to let go of them as a parent because now I need to be raising my kids. I need to pro be providing for them. I need to be beginning to put my focus on them. What are we called to do? We need to be still. The first point in this point is God says, be still and know me. Quit knowing, uh, trying to figure out about knowing everybody else's business and knowing what's going on in CNN and Fox and over here and over there and in their school and in their family and in their church. He says, be still and know me. God says, I'm the one that controls time. I control the productivity. He says, I'm what really matters. You need to know me more than you know everything else. You say, well, I just don't have time to spend with God. How can we say that? How can we allow the enemy to lie to us? Because we know without God, everything else, everything else is a waste. If we don't have God in it, it means nothing. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff will be added to you. This was in a passage where Jesus is telling them, don't worry. He said, you're worrying about all these other things? God knows what you need. He said, but seek God first and he's going to help you out with the rest. Let us take time. Be still and seek God. It says in Ephesians 5.16, we need to make the most of our time. It says making the most of your time because the days are evil. The days are short. King James says, redeem your time. He's saying slow down and make the most of your time. That doesn't mean doing the most you can in an hour, but making the most out of it, soaking it in, doing all you can with this time. And when you do that, God might even redeem the time. How many of you know God is control of all things? He even controls time. There's times when my day just slips away, and it's like I didn't get nothing done. But there's other days in the presence of the Lord and serving Him that at the end of this hour, I get a lot done. And I looked at the clock and said, how is that possible? 
It's possible because when we're making God the center and we're doing His work and making about His business, He can even allow us to get more done in a shorter amount of time. See, making the most of our time doesn't mean going 100 miles an hour with our hair on fire. It means enjoying the journey. It means tending to things that really matter. It means not getting distracted on some of this other stuff that's going to come up in, in your path. We have to learn to be still. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, be still. Look at your kid and say, kid, mighty man, be still. Watch this. In Mark 6, 31, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, come away for yourselves, by yourselves to a, a secluded place and let's rest for a while. Because there was many people coming and going and they didn't even have time to eat. Here's the scenario. Jesus in the middle of his ministry of loving, teaching, healing, feeding, all the stuff. And then there's a swarm of people. And they're all over him. And the disciples are trying to serve and they're trying to do. But it says they can't even eat, man. They don't even know what's going on. It's just a, a swarm of humanity. And Jesus says this, let's get away. Let's take a moment and let's get away. You see, when, li when life gets busy... Even when we're serving God, the busier life is, the more important it is to have the habit of slowing down. Even if it's just for a moment in your vehicle before that appointment, it's taking two minutes in the presence of God and saying, God, I need to slow down. I want to be still right now and know that you are God. I'm not going into this situation fretting, worrying with my mind sh sh scattered and shattered. But God, I want to be still and know we have to make it a habit because we're going to get busy and life's going to come at us. And if we don't have this habit of being still and knowing that he's God, we're going to get there and we're going to be so jacked up and wired up and frazzled that we're not going to be productive when we get there. We have to get away, rest, refresh, recoup, hear from God. And I'm going to be real honest with you. This is difficult for me. I struggle with this. This is one of my, at this point in my life, one of my biggest issues because I, I can't slow down. I can't slow my brain down. When I lay down at night, all I do is think about who was at church and who wasn't at church. I lay down and I think about what I said and what I didn't say. I think about what we need to be doing. I think about the issues. I think about who's sick. I think about all this stuff and I'm thinking about my kids and I'm thinking about what needs to be done at home and I can't shut it off and I have a hard time saying no and I can't relax. And I just can't stop. And when I do, if I take a few hours and I go play golf or I do something just set, you know what then? I feel guilty. And I feel like, and so I'm just being honest with you. I'm confessing the word of God says confess and you will be helped, forgiven, something like that. So I'm just saying, I struggle with this. But the reality is slowing down and being still in the presence of God is a sabbatical command. God says, I give you the sabbatical. I'm commanding you. Why? So that you can be blessed, so that you can stay healthy, so that you can refocus, so that you can be motivated and effective for what you do going ahead. Because what happens is when I start doing too much the same way with you, all of a sudden I become less effective than I was when I was doing half as much. Does that make sense? This is just something that God tells us. 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah has been running and gunning, man. He's a mighty man of God, a mighty prophet of God. He has just called fire down and destroyed 850 false prophets. He's glorifying God. He's got it going on. And at the end of that, guess what? He is smoked. He is done, even to the point where he doesn't want to live anymore. And in verse 4 of 1 Kings, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and he sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested that he might die. He said, God, it is enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's or anybody else. I'm done. This is what happens to you and I. We eventually get to this point where I'm done with church. I tried serving, I tried showing up, I tried a prayer, it doesn't matter, nobody cares, everybody's mad at me, this, that, and the other, and we just get burned out, and then that's exactly where he was at. But then he did the right thing, because he got away. He quit looking for people to admonish him, and he quit looking for somebody to give him the answer, or any of this stuff, and he got away, even though he was 
done, but he got away and he slowed down so that then the Lord could come and nourish him. And the Lord healed him and prepared him for the journey of head. We have to learn to get away so that God can heal us and God can nourish us so that we can be prepared for what's in front of us. And he was reminded of this. I need to be still and know that he is God. Can I tell you that when we keep this in our mind, that God is God, and I take these moments, even sometimes they're only little micro moments in a day, but I'm just going to be still for a moment and remind myself that He is God. And when we keep God on the forefront and we're seeking Him first, we're going to be able to handle anything and everything that this world throws in front of us. Sometimes, we used to say this all the time in roping, when I was rodeoing, but sometimes... You need to slow down to be fast. See, I was in a timed event, and sometimes you're trying to go so fast, and you're trying to go so hard that what happens is you make a mistake, and you make another mistake. And it don't matter how fast you go, you cannot go fast enough to make up for a mistake. And so sometimes in life, we need to slow down so that it will propel us to go faster than we ever would have been before. Number two today is this. Understand this, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. In this lifetime, we get a habit of wanting to cheat. We want to cut corners. It don't matter if it's in school or if it's on a project or if it's in our job or if it's planting wheat. I'm going to cut it short. I'm not going to do all the stuff that I really know needs to be done. I'm going to cheat this stuff. I'm going to cut corner because I want to get there ahead and I want to spend less. And, and you know what? We may get there first, but we're not going to have anything to offer because we haven't went through the process and done the work that it takes to prepare us to be ready for that moment when we get there. People, you all know this, especially in this generation, we want everything right now. It's called the microwave culture. We want it. We pop it in there, shoot it in there for 60 seconds, a minute and a half max, and I'm done. I get it out, and I take it. It's the same way in life. We want everything right now. We're raising up a generation that wants it right now. I want success right now. I want my money right now. I want my family right now. I want relationships. I want business. We even see it in church. Here it is. Throw it up. We want a church to be perfect. Can I tell you that there's nothing, there's no shortcuts, man. That's why it cracked me up when we first started. People say, well, we would come. We love the preaching. We love this. We love that. But you just don't have this. You don't have that. I don't have this. So we're not going to come right now now and I'm just thinking perfect because you're not the kind that we want because this is a process and this is a journey this ain't no microwave deal in a frying pan man it's going to take some time and it's going to take some effort man but if we do it the right way when the next season comes we're going to flourish greater than we did in the first season because we've done the work we didn't take a shortcut we didn't cut no corners we went through the process we do the same thing in church spiritually we go to church for a month we pray one prayer, and then all of a sudden, well, God ain't answered me, and everything hadn't happened, and I didn't get that job, and I didn't get that house, and I can't afford this new car. And so we just check out, and we forget that this is not a microwave thing. Jesus says it like this in Matthew chapter 7. He said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many that are going to enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are but a few who will find it. Yeah, there's some ways that are quicker and they are easier. But they're not going to be beneficial. And at the end of all this, we're going to find out that this is not what I wanted. You know what? This is kind of, I've been really saying some off the wall stuff. Forgive me for that. But. Maybe ACDC had it right when they said highway to hell. And let me show you what I mean. Because when you get on the highway, you can bump the speed up and you can set the cruise and you can kick back and you're going to be there shortly. But in the kingdom of God, when you're on the journey with the Lord headed to heaven, it's a journey with a rough, bumpy road. Where it's narrow and there's turns and there's hills and there's places you got to stop. And there's things you got to do that, that get in your way and there's breakdowns. And we're cussing it because this ain't no Cadillac and we feel like we're riding in an old jalopy of a wagon. 
And we don't understand that going this way is going to get us to where we need to be. Going this way is going to prepare me for these pit stops in life where I can be used by God. See, we're looking for a shortcut in life. And shortcuts are costly. Proverbs 21.5. It says, the plans of the diligent lead to advantage. But everyone who is hasty and in a hurry and cutting corners surely comes to poverty. He's saying this, Blessed is, blessedness is attached to faithfulness. One who's willing to go all the way. One who's willing to go through the fire. God says, man, I'm not just going to bless you, but I love you so much, I'm going to take you through the baptism of fire. You're not just going to speak in tongues, you're going to learn how to do battle on the other side of this thing. I'm going to take you through the process of refining you and changing you and making you into a warrior. You can get in a hurry and you can take a shortcut. And you know what it leads to? Mistakes and poverty. Oh, it looks so good. Can we be real? Some of us growing up, some of us still dealing with some of these things right now. It looks so good. Here's this opportunity. Here's this girl. Here's this pile of money they're promising me. Here's this thing. If I'll just cut here, if I'll just go this way. And Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that looks good. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's death. In the end, it's destruction. Let me tell you something. Shortcuts in the world are costly. They're going to catch up with us. But shortcuts spiritually destroys you. It takes you out because it gets us off track. It gets us going another way than the Lord's leading us. And God says this, I give you the way. I give you Jesus. He's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and life. No other way to get to the Father. He's the way. I'm giving him to you. Now follow him. Jesus hanging on a cross said, it's done. It is finished. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are made new. You are empowered. You are delivered. You are provided for. I've done it all. But now check this out. Philippians 2.12 says, man, I love you. But now do this. You did it in my presence, now did it, do it in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying forget the shortcuts and be willing to go all the way. Go all the way through the stuff. You're going to be tempted to cut across. You're going to be tempted when the coach isn't looking and you're practicing for cross country to cut the corner. You're going to be tempted in your job. You're going to be tempted in your career to cut corners. You're going to be tempted to cut this relationship short, you're going to be tempted. And he's saying, go all the way. Here's the promises. Accept the victory. Now put in the work to see it come to pass. He's given us the victory. Blessing, honor, destiny, everything that's written about you is true. Now let's work this thing out to see it come to pass in our life. 1 Timothy 6, 12. I love this scripture. I give it to people all the time. But it says, fight the good fight. It's all given to you. Now go get it. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you are called. You're going to have to fight some places. Don't get confused because you're saved, because you're under the blood, because you've been baptized, because you've been on a walk to a mass, because you've received the Holy Spirit. Don't be confused that all of a sudden life's going to be easy because you came to church over here at Bethel. I'll be honest with you. The more intense you get about going the way he's leading you, the more difficult it's going to be. Don't get confused and don't think something's wrong with you. Say, I'm going all the way. Do what it takes. We have to quit wasting time looking around for some kind of Ponzi scheme. Like I'm just going to wake up one day and it's all going to be given to me. Listen to me. God's already given it to us. Now let's walk in it. Let's go get it. Let's reveal him along the way. Revelation says it right to all the churches, to all of us. He says to him who overcomes, to him who is faithful to the end, to him who's willing to go through stuff. He is the one who's going to receive. Can I tell all of us? Can I tell our kids? Can I tell us? There aren't shortcuts, man. They're lying to you. If you want to be great in school, then put in the time. Do your work. Don't cheat off of somebody else. Don't cut corners. If you want to be great in athletics, man, put the work in, man. You may have shot good in practice, but keep practicing. If you want to excel, keep doing it. If you want to be great in relationships, you're going to have to go through heartbreak. And you're going to have to go through people irritating you. But go all the way. 
Because this is going to make you be able to experience great relationship. If you want to be a great parent, you've got to go through the heartache of kids hurting and kids dealing with stuff, man. But go all the way. Because you're going to raise up a child that sees that they've been, they've been shown how to go all the way. They understand this stuff. If we get caught coasting, we're going to be caught. You know what? I don't, I don't know very much. And, and I love being spiritual. But I'm telling you this. We have to do our part. God does everything for us, and we have to do our part. I just It's part of my mentality of growing up, and I've been so blessed. But in all the stuff that I've won and all the stuff that I've achieved, you know what? It really wasn't because I was more talented than anybody else. But it's because I grew up. Not because I was doing it for God, but because I grew up with an inferior, inferiority complex, basically, thinking I wasn't as good as somebody else. And so what that did was, it made me work harder. And I always had this mindset, no matter if it was in school, or if it was in basketball, or especially in my roping, my mindset was all, always this. If I'm not practicing, somebody else is practicing. If I'm not working, somebody else is working. And I'm not saying that's all that healthy, but I'm saying this. Spiritually speaking, we have to be willing to do the work. And you say, well, this goes just the opposite of what you said a while ago. Slow down. No, it doesn't. They go together. Because we slow down, and we know that He is God, and it strengthens us to go all the way with Him. Let us learn how to do work. Even in church, man. I pray for the anointing of God, but can I tell you, it doesn't happen because I don't read the Word of God all week. It doesn't happen because I don't pray but one time a week during church. It happens by the Spirit of God because I put in the time and I stay up late. I'm not saying I do anything. I'm just saying God's enabled me. And I want you to see that it's not magic. It's not a potion, but it's people when we're willing to work under the anointing of God and seeking Him first, then then there are no limits with what God can do. <laughs> there are bad habits, but there are also good habits if we're willing to implement them. To the two today, number one is we can get in the habit, we all get in this habit of trying to do too much too fast, and it'll end up costing us. At the very least, it's going to run us out of gas. I'm saying this, be aware in your days. Put it on your phone. Set an alarm on your fancy iPhone at whatever time of the day to remind you to slow down, be still, and know that he is God so that then I can enjoy the journey. And keep in mind that there are no shortcuts. Don't get discouraged because you ain't got it all just yet. But you're on your way, baby. I'm going all the way. I'm going to do what it takes so that I'll be prepared when I get there. Can I tell you this? Shortcuts and microwaves are tempting. And we use a microwave way more than I'd like at my house. But they're tempting. I don't mean nothing negative. It's just, I praise God for microwaves or I'd be, I'd die. <laughs> but I'm saying this. Microwaves, y'all got me in trouble with the way you laughed at that. <laughs> God, I, I love you, baby. You, I just, God. Shortcuts, microwaves are tempting. But the good stuff, the good stuff is slow cooked. It's baked, it's grilled, it's simmered, it's taken time for it to come. Let me tell you, and I'm done. Music team, y'all can come. Elijah, told you the story about Elijah. I, Elijah was smoked, and he slowed down. He slowed down, not so that he could be done and go to heaven or whatever. He slowed down. If you read the story, you'll understand. He slowed down to prepare him. The angel of the Lord came and it nourished him, woke him up and fed him and gave him drink. He went back to sleep. He woke him up a second time and he fed him and he gave him drink. And the angel of the Lord said, this is to prepare you. You need your strength for the journey is long ahead. And right after that, he got up and he ran 40 days. Ran. <laughs> Slow down, not because you're done, not because you're being lazy, but to prepare you for the journey ahead so that you can go all the way.
Pray with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for this day, God. I thank you just for your anointing. Lord, just the stillness in this place. I just sense it even with our kids. And God, I just pray that even at a young age, the young ones that are here, they would just begin to know that you are God. They would just begin to have a yearning to know you and want to accept Jesus when the time comes. But God, for the rest of us, Lord, as we're here today, and if we're all honest, God, I'd say 80% of us are, are, are going way too fast. And our mind's going in too many different directions. And Lord, I just pray that this would be a defining moment when we just heard the voice of the Lord. Not a scripture, not a sermon, but the voice of the Lord saying, Slow down, be still, and know that I am God. For I am the one that will be exalted above your work day, above your kids' ball games, above your roping and your stock showing and everything else. I will be exalted. God, just... Just give us that sense to know that you are God and that you're with us and, and you do give us strength and you are our refuge and our strength and an ever-present help in time of trouble because we're taking these moments to know you. God, some of us, sometimes we're, we're so tired because we've been trying to do too much and, and so we want to take shortcuts and we want to cut corners and we don't want to go through the process of preparing and the journey. And God, I just pray that as we be still and know that you're God, that you would... Give us new strength to go all the way with you. So I just want to encourage you today, if you're just crazy busy and your mind even feels fried like mine does sometimes, I just want to encourage you to come before the Lord to an altar and just declare that, God, right now I want to be still. God, right now I'm taking this moment to just be still in your presence that nothing else matters in this moment because I want to remember and know that you alone are God. And God, for some of us maybe that have been wanting to give up, and we've been looking for a loophole in life, and God, I just pray that by your spirit that you would empower us today to go all the way. So if you're weak and you feel like you can't make it or you're looking for a corner to cut, I would encourage you to come. Just like Elijah in the presence of the Lord, that you would be nourished and that you would gain strength for the journey ahead. God, I just pray that you move in this place. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you can be still or... Or go all the way, but if you don't know Jesus, you're doing it for nothing. At the end of the day, what really matters is Jesus. We sang about it earlier, but Jesus, Jesus. He's the way. It's his name that will help you battle fear, anxiety, stress, whatever you're dealing with. It's Jesus. He came and died for you so that you could be saved. If you've never accepted him today, he's offering it. And all you've got to do is say, I want that. If you've never done that and you want to receive Jesus or accept his sacrifice, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Say, I need Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you right there. Thank you back there. Anybody else? Thank you, young man. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Father, you see the hands, and I just pray that even in this moment, they would just know that you are God, and the love that you have over them would cover them, God, and would again strengthen them for the calling on their lives. God, I just pray that you would move now as we close. The altars are open. Let your kids go. You know what? If the Lord's speaking to you and you got a kid with you, we'll help you with your children. Right this minute, just what is the Lord saying to you? And if he is, feel freedom to respond today as they sing over you. Let us worship the Lord.